Would you be standing for the reading of the gospel? Our words are from Paul to this church at Colossae. In a portion of our scripture, I cannot help but think the words for, for us this morning were divinely inspired given events of our days. Colossians 3, verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, again, I can't, I can't tell you how much my heart hurts today. It just does. And I was uh, visiting with the choir this morning, and of course, we all knew the news, and you walk into the choir room downstairs, and it just, our hearts are just heavy, without exception, and you look for words to say, and I, again, I, when you're a pastor, the theologian side of you kicks in, and I know the things to say, and I know the scriptures to quote, and I know the answers to give, or at least a few of them, nevertheless, I just hurt, and I got used to, even though I've only been here a short time, looking over my left shoulder and seeing Jay Watley there, and I can't tell you what a smile that brought to my face, and I am going to miss him. Which is as it should be. Jesus calls us to be close to one another. Amazingly so, when you think about it, and I've actually gotten a fair amount of trouble over the years. I know you can't imagine that, but I have, and, and uh, because for me, church has never been professional. It's personal, and the people who work with us, their family, congregation members, our family, and that means the relationship just runs a slightly different way, and when I was in seminary, you know, they would teach us to run it like a business and to keep an emotional distance. And I understand why they teach us this ways, and maybe there's some wisdom in these things, but I've never read a gospel passage yet where Jesus kept it professional. I just haven't. It was personal. He loved those he was with, and they loved him back. And I really think it's only through that lens of a tremendous love for each other that we can view ourselves and the world and come anything close to how Jesus sees us now and how especially as we move into Easter, how God the Father sees His Son. We have to remember that the core of our faith is a relationship. It's between a dad and his boy, a father and a son that forms the bedrock of everything that we say and do. And there is just tremendous love in the core of that. That's what gives our faith such power. Christianity is not some list of rules to be memorized. It's not a set of legal obligations. We try to make it that sometimes, but it's not. What our faith is, is a relationship between his dad, his boy, and us. 
And unless we see Christianity as family, boy, do I think we've missed it. And maybe, maybe you know, as, as I think about Jay and remember him, and I have to believe, even though, I, even though it's, <laughs> it's somewhat foggy, I have to believe that if I follow the love I feel for people, my friends, my family, and as I, as I take in the love that they have for me and Christ works through that, if I follow that presence, that loving presence, and let that be my guide, I have to believe that at the end of that road of love is heaven itself and Christ there. And so what I rejoice in, even though it's very hard, is that for my friend Jay, those promises are now true. And if I follow that road again, one day those promises will be true for me and they'll be true for you and they'll be true for anyone who walks this road with us. But it's a loving one. And it's one where we have to remember at the core of our calling is a deep, deep love for one another and love for God that we are asked to perfect as much we can in this life. And that means there are going to be days, though, that we hurt because we've lost someone dear to us. Jay was a little one of a kind. I, I have to tell you, in my first interaction with him, I came down after it was announced that I was going to be senior pastor of First Methodist Houston. That was, that was a great day for me, and uh, it's probably a, a day our church is still recovering from, but we're moving through it okay. And um, I came down, I live in the woodlands, came down, meet everybody, and I got the chance to meet Terry and Jay for the first time. I've seen them on TV, and, uh, but never met them, and so I had a chance to talk with them, and I remember I called Deborah on the way back. It's like, I am so looking forward to working with these guys, because they're great at what they do, <laughs> and I'm, I'll be frank here. Sometimes as pastor, you know, we work with a lot of musicians, and God kind of made a, a lot of musicians that think they are God. I don't know if you've ever worked with these <laughs> Yeah, we don't have any here at First Methodist Houston. I'm so grateful. But, but Jay and Terry are not guys like that. They're really guys that use their talent so that the church comes first. And your worship experience comes first in their hearts. And they poured themselves into it. And it's what made what they do magical. I never had the feeling that when I was up here listening to Jay or to our choir, I've never had the feeling that, gosh, they held back today. They gave their best. They humbled themselves. They gave their best to Jesus every single week, and I think that's just part of the magic that Jay knew. As of those first few days, as I was, kind of was, it was, as I was coming on board here, I'm, I mean, it's a lot of, uh, well, several folks had Googled me in, in my previous life before I became Anglican. I was this Christian hipster. And, uh, and so I was getting all these notes about, what are you going to change? What are you going to change this, change that? What are you going to, and it's like, you know, I'm, I'm just not there. And finally, in the midst of all this, I get this email from, from Jay. And it said this, it said, uh, whenever you need Lady Gaga's bad romance to sound like a Bach fugue, I'm ready to go. <laughs> and I thought that was so Awesome. And uh, little did I know that shortly after my arrival, he actually played it as the postlude, but I'm such a buffoon. I totally missed it. And, uh, <laughs> anyway, and I know you would have griped about it had you known, so you must have missed it too, you know? <laughs> yeah. What a great spirit, you know? What a great sense of humor. What a great man. And um, again, it's, uh, it hurts. But... At, you know, at our heart, I just have to remember, we have to hold on to the relationships that mean the most to us. And that means that there are certain things that we're going to have to sacrifice. And, you know, we've, we've been um, in this series on relationships at First Methodist Houston, and today's topic was forgiveness. And what's true is, is that if you're, if you're a friend of anybody for any length of time, or if you're a colleague for anybody, or with anybody for any length of time, if you live in a family at all, if you've ever been married or dated for the long term, or you're going to have to forgive the other person you love. It's going to happen. They are also going to have to forgive you 
Because in the way we kind of work in our sinful, blind selves sometimes, it means that there are going to be days where wrong is done to us. It is. We will be short-sighted. We will feel neglected. We will have wrong done to us. It's just, it happens. There will also be that ugly day where we are the person doing the wrong. And that's particularly ugly for somebody like me because ego and pride want to defend and prop up these buildings that we erect in the name of our own righteousness and watching them fall. Oh, so hurts. But we do this in sort of a blind, miserable effort to walk life. And what amazes me is somehow um, people don't see always the power of forgiveness in the sense that forgiveness has a chance to start things over, and forgiveness has a chance to make things new. But forgiveness really is the statement by God to us and us to each other that we value our relationship with each other more than being right. You know, Jesus is looking down on all of us right now, and He knows your heart. He knows mine. He knows your thoughts. He knows mine. He knows your actions, and He knows mine. And what makes Him even, His viewpoint even more um, fearful, maybe, is that not only does He know uh, what we've done, He can see the implications of everything we've done in a way we can't. You don't know the harm you've caused. You don't. You don't know the implications of your short-sightedness. You can't see them all. But Jesus does, and in spite of what he sees, and in spite of what he knows, and in spite of some of the revulsion he feels at what you and I do, he says this, he says, I value a relationship with you more than being right. I will take the punishment for your sin so that we might still be together because I love you that much. And Jesus' heart, there was not at its center a list of rules. There was not in its center a list of things that we must do. It was this burning desire to love us and to love us fully. And if we don't understand that about him, we understand nothing. Christianity is a love affair of God with us through his son, and he calls us to celebrate the same way here amongst us. Love each other. This is what Paul goes for when he's writing to us. Bear with each other and forgive each other. Whatever grievances you may have against one another, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have with one another. Boy, that's a hard verse, isn't it? Have you ever had to bear with anybody? Have you ever had to bear with your spouse? Maybe it's just Deborah and I. The rest of you all have perfect marriages. How lovely. That's wonderful. And a great credit to your hypocrisy and nothing more. We've all had that day to bear with each other. Have you ever had a day where you're angry at your spouse from the moment you wake up? That's a great day, isn't it? It's a great day to be on both sides of that. Because even though the scripture says, don't let the sun set on your anger, oh, we do because the moonlight is so lovely as we see, isn't it? How many times have you stayed awake at night just angry at your spouse? Staring at the ceiling, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning. Anger. Bear with each other. But Paul says it's worth it. Value your relationship with each other more than being right. Work it out. Bear with it. And then once you find the power to forgive each other, then your relationship has a new day. If we stay the course, there's something greater to be had, but we have to bear with it. What amazes me in our culture is how many people don't. Relationships are disposable. As soon as it comes time to a challenging part, I quit. I'll just find a new one because I'd rather have some sort of illusion than to bear with things so that I can see a new reality. Bearing with is hard. Forgiveness is hard. I remember my wife and I, when we first got married, and we kind of had different understandings of some things, and we didn't realize it. And 
And one day my wife took her car out. She didn't tell me. It was a Honda Civic. She took out the Honda Civic because it was dirty, and she went to wash it in a coin-operated car wash. In my family, we didn't do that. It was a violation of the 11th commandment. In my family, what you did is you got your bucket, you got your hose, you filled up your bucket, you got your sponge, you got your soap, and you washed your own car. That's what you did. Because God ordained it to be so. So my wife, the infidel that she is, she took her car and she goes to have it washed. I'm seething in anger when she comes back. I am so mad. Again, we had not been married that long. And she comes in. I said, what did you do? And she's like, what? I said, what did you do? She said, I went to wash my car. I said, how much money did you spend on that? She said, $1.25. <laughs> So what did I do wrong? And she burst out into tears. And I realized, Andy, you are an idiot. Stop. Stop. We have to value our love for each other more than being right. And we have to be open sometimes to realize that our way isn't always the way. And if we do that, we have a chance to, to experience forgiveness. And again, we need it. Sometimes I'm saddened by the fact that, because I think it's true for your church too. How many times do people just jump their church or leave their church because they, they won't forgive it? The height of the Christian gospel not practiced in the community of faith? What a sad witness. And so I might even push that a little further and say, you know, there may be some things you need to forgive your church about. There need, may need to be some things that as pastor, I just ask for your forgiveness about because we're not perfect. We're highly flawed. And we try hard and we pray hard and we work hard. And Even in spite of all that, though, sometimes we just do the wrong thing. Forgiveness extended to your church needs to be part of what we think about as we talk about the power of relationships. And I think about that, too. You know, as pastor, I get to see people at their beautiful best, and sometimes I get to see them at their worst. And, and that's true for two. Pastors have to sometimes forgive people in the church because they're not perfect, and that's okay. And what we value is our connection to you more than maybe this endless conversation about who's, who's right. Forgiveness is a new day. It's hard. It's something we have to have, though. We can't live life without it. And what makes it, I think, easier is when we're disciplined. If we're worshiping regularly, if we're studying the Word often, if we're praying every day, to me, forgiveness is sort of a fruit of a well-cultivated spiritual soil. And that when we're living a disciplined Christian life, it's easy to see, or it's easier to see maybe, the power and the necessity of forgiveness and to practice it. What gets people into trouble, I find as a pastor sometimes, is all of a sudden there's this great need for forgiveness in a family or in a person or whatever, but there's no spiritual soil. There's been no cultivation. There's been no spiritual discipline. There's been no development of virtue. And so all of a sudden this person is having to pick a fruit, forgiveness, for which they've not cultivated a good ground. And that puts folks in a hard dilemma. What I notice about Paul is, as I was reading his passage, and I mean, he just has a brilliance about this, is he connects the power of a spiritually disciplined life with the fruit of forgiveness. He says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. It's an impressive list. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. If we cultivate that, when we need forgiveness, it will be in our grasp. Without a foundation such as Paul describes, however, forgiveness, I think, is harder to know because there's so much that the devil can put in our way. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. 
the discipline cult cultivation of these virtues is the entryway to forgiveness. So we're at the start of Lent. It's a time to kind of in, introduce maybe a, some spiritual disciplines. And I'm going to suggest some for us today to take on. Lent starts with Ash Wednesday. Uh, the church always says it's a 40-day season, which is technically true if you take out the Sundays. If you include the Sundays, it's 46. That's just kind of how we've marketed it over the years. But it starts on Wednesday. And so the answer is, what are you going to give up? And for many of us, that's probably a good conversation to have. You know, we started the new year, January 1, with all these uh, New Year's resolutions to be, you know, holier and healthier, and we're still as fat and sinful now as we were in January. So this is a chance for us to give it another go through being a little more disciplined. So let me throw out some of it, and I'm going to throw out some ideas to you that I think are based on my observations of some things we're not good at at First Methodist Houston, Okay. So let's start a few. One, worship every week. Every seventh day, you're here. Every seventh day. I'm a little concerned that some of our broadcast TV and our streaming over the internet, while a great evangelical tool that many watch and take advantage of every week, and I'm grateful for that, for some of us, it's been used the wrong way. Like, I've had lots of conversations with folks at First Methodist Houston, just going to be honest, that said, you know, I got up today and I just didn't feel like coming to church, so I watched it on TV. Am I really supposed to spiritually endorse your laziness? <laughs> the answer is no. Every seventh day you're here. I get it if you're the nurse that's pulling the all-night shift. I've gotten letters from her about how she watches us on TV. I get if you're sick. I get if some of our elderly members, they can't be here. I get that. But I also get some of us have bought into this lazy idea, which is not biblical or Christian at all. And so every seventh day you're here. If you have to be out of town on Sunday, the odds are pretty good. God has Christians near you where you're going. I look forward to receiving the bulletins from the worship services you attend. <laughs> Every seventh day. You need to pray for your church every day. You need to spend time in God's Word every day. If you're not, start. It's something you've got to do. You cannot inherit the fruits of the gospel without a spiritual cultivation of the soil. It just won't work. And so every seventh day, be here. Every day, study, pray for your church. There is a, a, a worship resource that we've produced. It's available in our connection point. You can also download it online. For our next series, it's called Shackled, Setting People Free from the Things That Bind Us. But if you want to go deeper on a daily and weekly base, uh, basis, Brandy Horton, one of our pastors, has written a devotional guide for you to use individually with your small group or your Sunday school class. You can find it at www.fmhouston.com shackled. We'll be emailing that out to you. But download it. Use it. Spend time with it. Go the extra mile. If you do so, that's one way which we can cultivate the soil from which the fruit of the gospel needs to grow. Financially, we have to become more disciplined as a congregation. I've seen the business on the inside, and we have wild swings between when people give and when we don't. We have got to work this out and kick out this demon of crisis sort of financing for the gospel. So in addition to your weekly worship attendance, in addition to your daily prayer and study of Scripture, disciplined financial generosity has got to be part of what you do. If you are not doing that now, start. If you've been on your way to tithing, step up. But generosity has to be part of it because there is no way you can experience the fullness of the gospel without a generous spirit. It won't happen. Daily worship attendance, or weekly worship attendance, daily discipline, prayer, reading the gospel, taking advantage of our worship resource, generous financial giving, and then a mission-oriented something. There has to be a way in which we serve. 
Now, why would I say all this? To win a popularity contest? No. We're going to have an administrative board meeting on March the 22nd. And I've asked to expand the attendance. And I am asking, as senior pastor of First Methodist Houston, for every household that is a member to have a representative there. I have been at work, and many of you have asked, it's been the number one question, Andy, what's a vision for our church? I believe I have the framework for an answer. I think I know, because Jesus has worked with me to see it, what we need to do, the decisions we need to make in order to head in a more evangelical and holy direction. I want to share that with you at our meeting in March, and you'll be getting notifications about this. Here's the deal, though. I don't want you to come unless you're ready. I don't want you to come unless you're ready. And if you're ready, what that means is you're worshiping every week. You're praying for your church and reading scripture every day. You are financially generous, and you're involved in a mission-minded something. That's a powerful Christian, isn't it? It's one through which the Spirit can move. And it's one that I think wants to have a deep relationship with Christ, with each other, with the church, and with the world. And if we can, in an even greater way, Lay a hold of that at First Methodist Houston. Oh, what a church. Oh, what a church. Oh, what a church we will be because our relationships are well-practiced and right. Let us pray.